Right, if you would, open up your Bible to Psalms chapter number 23. I want to share a quick word with you this evening. Psalms 23, a very familiar passage of Scripture. We can all probably quote it uh, this evening, but I want to look at it uh, from a unique uh, point of view this evening. As you're turning there, we're going to specifically hone in on verse number 4. As you're turning there, I want to tell you I love the mountains. I love the mountains, and God does too as we read His Word. I mean, they in part define who I am. And uh, I, the security of it and the familiarity of it, I absolutely love uh, the hills and the hollers of West Virginia. Uh, but we know uh, uh, with the mountain, in order for a mountain to be there and to exist, there must be some valleys around it, right? And speaking of a valley, I want to take a look at one tonight. And uh, I just want to remind you of this this evening, that God is still so much God as He is on the hills just like he is down in the valleys. Right. And with the help of the Lord for the next couple of moments, that's just what I want to preach on. The God of the hills and valleys. We look uh, to verse number 4 of Psalms 23 and we'll find our valley. David pens, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest uh, the table before me in the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Watch your Bible. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We see that this psalm depicts the very trail that you and I will trod in our Christian life. Oh yes, all the days of our life as we see in verse number 6. It shows us clearly uh, the valley that we all face. See, although it may be different in its length, it may be different as circumstantially, it may be different in its difficulty and even in its degree of darkness, still yet it is the same valley that we are all walking through. And as we take a look at this valley, we find that David, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, gives us a clear picture of how God works in the valley and how we are to walk in the valley. With this in mind, I want to look closer to verse number four as David is saying, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Uh, just a few moments ago, I established that in order to have a valley, you must have some hills around it. Uh, so we see our valley in our text tonight, but I want to propose a question. Where are our mountains? Well, whenever you're physically in a valley, you don't have to look too far. You just look to the left and to the right, and you will see the mountains around you. Tonight, I believe it's the same in God's Word, and not by a coincidence or not by happenstance, but I believe that God divinely appointed uh, the Psalms to be ordered this way. Turn with me to Psalms 22 just real quick. We see on one side of the valley of the shadow of death, David under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost pins down in Psalms 22 verse number 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and far from the words of my roaring? We know in Psalms 22 this is a messianic psalm and this is a prophetic psalm and it's jam-packed full of prophecy concerning Christ on the cross. The very first words we read in this psalm is one of the great seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is not up for debate tonight. This is a clear picture of Mount Calvary. Now we take a gander on the other side of this great valley. Turn with me quickly to Psalm chapter number 24. We look to verse number 3. The Bible says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? What is the hill of the Lord? Any Bible student in here tonight knows that the hill of the Lord is Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion geographically and physically? Mount Zion is the temple mount found in Jerusalem. This is where the Shekinah glory of God dwells and is shown. But we know, thanks be unto God, as Christ cried on the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That old temple 
veil was rent in two, now giving every child of God access to establish Mount Zion no matter where they are. So we can't talk about Mount Zion on a physical uh, aspect, but now we must look at a spiritual application. And as we peek through this spiritual lens, we will come to the conclusion that Mount Zion is also a representation and a picture of heaven. That is where God's glory resides in its fullness. And we know that Mount Zion is a picture of our eternal home and our heavenly destination. So on one side of this great valley, we find Mount Calvary. On the other side of this great valley, we see Mount Zion. Mount Calvary being every Christian's starting point. Mount Zion being every Christian's finishing point. And what does that mean uh, that is going to consume all the days of our life? It's found in our text tonight, the valley of the shadow of death. Yes, this is the very Christian journey that we have been called and chosen to walk hand in hand with Christ. You say, preacher, how am I supposed to do it? The next time you get discouraged, find yourself in Psalms chapter number 23 and just walk your way through in this great sacred text. Let's look with the, with the preacher tonight in verse number one. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When he becomes yours, you are not left wanting for, and I'm thankful, he's a satisfying shepherd. But I find great interest and great value in the very first phrase that comes off of David's uh, pen. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. This is an old age David. This is David at the peak of his power. And he is telling his entire kingdom, though you look to me as your shepherd, there is one that is higher than I. And he is my shepherd. All the humility that we find in this psalm. But watch your Bible in verse number two. He says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. I don't always want to do what God has called me to do. My flesh isn't always as willing as it ought to be, but I sure am thankful that he is enough God that he can break my will so that his will may come forward and to fruition. And then he says this, he leadeth me uh, beside the still waters. This isn't my own doing. This isn't by my design. This isn't my plan or my avenue that I chose. There is a God in heaven that has designed this for me and he leads my every step. Oh, I'm thankful that his word can be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And then we read that the Bible says he restoreth my soul. This is a king. Uh, David, he is the very one who the Bible says is a man after God's own heart. He knows what it's like to be on the highest of hills. But let's not forget David also knows what it's like to be in the lowest of valleys. It was King David that pinned down Psalms 55 where he said, God create in me a new heart. And he said, God restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Over in Psalms 139, he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thought. See, David knew the value. He knew the necessity of a Christian requiring of God uh, for him to restore their soul. Oh, unto God tonight, if the church would get beside all our problems, get beside all our groups, all our cliques, and we would just come up to an old-fashioned altar and allow the tears to begin to stream down our face once again and let the sweet spirit of God sit in our lap and stir our soul that we would desire a soul that's been restored by the hand of God. And you say, what's the product of that preacher? Well, we go on to read a little bit further. David answers it and he says, once you get a restored heart, he leads me to the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It ain't about David no more. Hey friend, it's not about Chandler O'Brien. It's not about Dr. John Smith. It's not about the great Taze Valley Baptist Church. A friend, whenever you have a restored heart, you'll be able to preach him high and holy, meek and lowly, uh, crucified, buried, risen, and coming again. It is all for his name's sake. Once you get that restored soul, you'll get in the glory. And then he says this, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm going to have to try to land this plane without crashing. Dear Lord, help us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
we see that David is speaking swiftly about the control of the shepherd. That first word he says, yea. He's saying in spite of, despite the darkness, despite the uncertainty, despite the uncomfort, I will trust in him. See, David was able to go back in his mind and look back from his pen and say, God is the one that took me by those green pastures. God is the one that led me to the still waters. And if he has brought me this far, it is not in vain, but he will see me through. Our shepherd is still in control. No matter your problem, no matter the difficulty, just trust in him. That's the control of the shepherd. Oh, but then we also see the comfort of the shepherd. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He's comforted by the shepherd because he's confident in the shepherd. There's not one thing that we can be confident of by man. No, the only thing that we can have confidence in tonight is in God's holy book divine. Uh, Isaiah said it like this, the grass may wither and the flower may fade away, but the word of God will stand forever. This is the only thing that we can have confidence in. My confidence is not in a politician. My confidence is not in my occupation. My confidence is the one that resides on heaven's throne and he is enough God to comfort your heart in the middle of the valley. I don't know if y'all are helping, getting any help from this or enjoying this, but I sure am. We see the closeness of the shepherd after the confidence. You say, hey, preacher, how can you say I will fear no evil? Because the next words he says, thou art with me. See, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Whenever we get so close to him, see what David was pointing out, he says in verse number two and three, he leadeth me. In verse number four, he says, thou art with me. In verse number six, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. A friend, you can get so close to the shepherd that he's going before you. He's beside you. And honey, he's even behind you. I believe James hit the nail on the head whenever he wrote, if you draw nigh unto God, he is faithful to draw nigh unto you. Unto God, if we would just draw nigh unto him, get rid of our pride and come before him wanting for him to move in our heart. We see the closeness. You say, preacher, how do I know I'm close to him? Well, watch what he says. I mean, David answers our questions tonight and our wondering. He says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Hey, I know I'm close to him and I can get comfort from the correction I receive. Praise the Lord Jesus doesn't just love me enough to save me, but he is sanctifying me every single day. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Oh, yes, for I'm still baking in the oven, and one day he's going to pull me out and say, well done. Glory, hallelujah. Some of y'all will get that later on down the road. Oh, but I'm thinking, he's still working on me, friend. He's still molding me into the image and the likeness of his precious son. I'm thankful that we can be comforted by the closeness and by the correction of of our shepherd, that rod, it's used to slap us up against the side of the head every now and again. That staff, it grabs a hold of our neck and brings us back into the fold. We can be comforted by this. Oh, all these things are great and all these things are wonderful, but we can't apply it unless we go back to verse number one. The next time you're overwhelmed by your surroundings down in the valley, just remind yourself of the certainty of the shepherd. What does he say at the beginning of the verse? He says, the Lord is. Child of God, this is the only phrase we need to depend on and recite until kingdom come. The Lord is. Preacher, I got a problem. I got a burden. Oh, I, I, got, a, I got a battle before me. I don't know what I'm going to do. The Lord still is able. I'm here to tell you tonight that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob still is. The God of Moses and Aaron still is. The God of the prophet still is. And the God of the apostles still is. The God of our forefathers still is. The God of my father and the God of my pastor still is. And as long as he still is, what is there to worry about? Oh, that's the shepherd we serve. As we find ourselves in the valley, remind yourself of this. We find that God brings us to the valley. I'm landing up preacher, I promise. God brings us to the valley because that's where the water resides. So you ain't going to find no beans growing on the top of a mountain. You won't find no potatoes or tomatoes growing on top of the mountain. If you hunt for ramps or molly moochers, you ain't going to find them on top of a mountain. No, you got to go down into the deepest, darkest part of the valley. 
And it's there where God will lead his children. That he may plant us in his grace so that we'll grow in his glory. Church, he's still the God of the hills and valleys only if we'll trust him. Thank you.